go. <clears throat> All right. It's a few minutes past seven. I feel like I'm on the radio <clears throat> doing that. It's a few minutes past the top of the hour. We'll get you back into. I don't know. We've got the. We've got the uh, dishwasher going. Nice little back. So it's. I think that that was a staple for a long period of time on Wednesday nights. It seemed like it was going on every Wednesday night. <clears throat> well, I'm not sure who all is on, but they're not on yet. They'll be on shortly, and uh, we'll go ahead and <clears throat> we'll go ahead and get started. Tonight. I think this is number 14 in the Fruit of the Spirit <clears throat> series. Uh, we've made our way down to faith, so we're almost of the two verses that we really are looking at. And um, we see See, we've only got two left after tonight, so we'll see how long it takes us to get through faith, and uh, we'll go from there. When I when I printed out all the verses that I was that I've been looking at to do, uh, I think it ended up being 11 pages, and we might take it more than more than one video to do this one. <clears throat> we'll make up for the. Good, the gentleness and goodness that only did one. So, uh, go ahead. We'll get started. <clears throat> Twenty-two. As always, read down to the end of the chapter, and then we'll get going. <clears throat> In Galatians chapter five, verse twenty-two. But the fruit of the spirit is. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to study your word. That you've provided us information, not just about what you've done for us in the past, but how you work through us now and the things you're going to do with us and through us and the ages to come to bring honor and glory to your Son, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. <clears throat> so, we've made our way up. We've talked about love and joy and peace and long-suffering and gentleness and goodness. And we get up to faith, which is the last, last one of the Fruit of the Spirit in verse 22, and then there's two others that we'll talk about in verse 23. And then, of course, we're going to have to deal with that statement where he says, against such there is no law, and uh, we'll, we'll deal with that whenever we whenever we get to it. And, you know, we've, we, we've dealt with this based on the fact in, Rome, in, in Galatians chapter 5, he starts off and talks about standing fast, therefore, in the liberty which with Christ has, has, hath made us free. And be not entangled again with the yoke and bondage. And so the issue that he starts off in chapter 5, and of course it's based off of what he's dealing with in chapter 4 and 3 and all the stuff prior to that, about there's not a law, and that's that's what he's getting at at the end of chapter 5, verse 23, against such there's no law, dealing with the liberty that we have in Christ. The, the position that we have because we're in Christ and the way that God works through us, through his word. Um, you know, it's one of those things a lot of people <clears throat> look at how is it that, that God works through through us today. A lot of people say, you know, God works through circumstances and things like that. And the way that they know that they're in God's will is because things are working well for them. And if they're not working well, then that means they're out of the will of God. And what it comes down to is the Word of God is the will of God. The way that God works through believers today, specifically in the dispensation of the grace of God, is through His Word, not just through His Word, but His Word rightly divided. And it's the correct application of... 
of sound doctrine is what's going to produce this fruit. And again, as we've said before, notice he starts off in verse 22 and it says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, he goes on. So it's the fruit that the Spirit is going to produce. It's not, you know, and a lot of people, and we've said this before, a lot of people take this list and say, well, if you're producing these things, then we know that you're saved. Well, what it has to do with is you're going to produce these things, or the Spirit's going to produce these things, if you have sound doctrine built up in you. And we've talked about that a bunch. So then when we come down to this to this this word right here, faith. Go with me real quick. We're we're gonna we're gonna do something else. But I want to start here first. Go over to Ephesians. Go over to Ephesians, and one of the one of the things that's misconstrued is faith. You know. When we take a look at this, go over to Ephesians chapter 2. There's misconceptions that a lot of a lot of denominations, specifically one particular group of people, uh, and I've, I've heard people say this about Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, specifically verse 8. Notice in, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, Paul says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. So there's issues that people have with verse 8 that they change some things to make it as if faith was the gift that God gave. Well, that's not the gift that God gave in the passage. And it's not even grace is the gift that God gave. It's salvation. You know, you go over to Romans. In Romans chapter 5, Paul talks about there's this gift that we have and a gift of, and he talks about this gift all the way through. And then he says, the gift of righteousness. Well, in order to be righteous, you have to be saved. And what that is, is God gives you the gift of righteousness the moment that you place your faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of His Son, Jesus Christ. When you place your faith that Jesus Christ died personally for your sins, that, they, that He was buried, and that He rose three days later. When you place your faith in that and that alone, at that moment, you, re, you receive the gift of salvation, the gift of righteousness. So much so that, that God tells us through Paul's, Paul's scriptures, he tells us that, that he made Christ to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So not only are we declared right, God said he's made us the righteousness of God in him. And what, what the problem is, is people miss the gift. They think that the gift, and they, they misconstrue Ephesians 2.8, saying that the gift is faith. Well, the other thing is, and let's go over here real quick. Go over to Romans chapter 12. And I'm going to get to this verse here in a little bit. <clears throat> because I've heard, I've heard this spoken of before, too. And I even said some things incorrectly about this because at the time I didn't know what was going on and what it, what it was and all this other stuff. And I've learned a lot of things and I've I've had in in Romans chapter twelve, verse three, Paul says, "For I say, through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly." Notice, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. And so there's this idea that God has to give you a particular measure of faith, and that's what allows you to believe. Well, that's what Calvinism teaches, is God has to give you the faith, and he gives you a certain measure of faith, and then people talk about, well, um, I have great faith, or I have little faith, or... You know, people talk about, well, they have very little faith in um, our government. Or some people will say that they have great faith that you're going to be able to accomplish whatever job that I give you to do at your job. All right? And people, people misuse that word. And so what I want to deal with, and I'm going to, I'm going to deal with this, this verse in Romans chapter 12, verse 3. What does it mean when he's talking about the measure of faith? And we're going we're to take a look at that. But 
What I want to start off with, dealing with faith, is just a definition that I got, and then I'm going to take a look at what the Bible actually talks about is faith. Faith is a belief, the assent of the mind to the truth of what is declared by another, resting on his authority and veracity without other evidence, the judgment that what another states or testifies is the truth. Now, we're going to find out that that's a really good definition of faith. It's almost a really good biblical definition of faith. But it's the ascent of the mind to the truth of a proposition advanced by another belief or probable evidence of, of, any, of, of any kind. Basically, what it's saying is you're, you're agreeing with something that somebody's already said. That's basically what that's saying. In, in layman's terms, if you want to think of it that way, that's what it is. It's you're agreeing with something that somebody says. And that person who you agree with has some sort of authority to back it up. <clears throat> all right, we're going to take a look at that. So first of all, what I want to do is everybody usually goes to, so let's go there, Hebrews chapter 11. Everybody calls that the great hall of faith. You know, everybody talks about hall of fame. You know, basketball coaches, hall of fame coaches, and football coaches, they, you know, players go into the hall of fame, the best of the best. And people, Christians, call Hebrews chapter 11 the hall of faith. And it's for good cause. <clears throat> but notice in, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, and this is, this is what <clears throat> a lot of people go to and say, well, this is the definition of faith. And does it work pretty well? Yeah. But we're going to take a look at some other things and see exactly what it is as we go through. So notice in, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse one. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now my dad, before he passed away in 2011, so it was uh, February 27th, 2011, my dad passed away. Before he passed away, before his mind started to change and he wasn't himself the past month or so, before all this stuff changed, we would have conversations, and he told me one day, he said, Greg, I finally figured it out. Hebrews 11, 1, what faith is, is the fact that you don't see it says that you've got it. And so I'm sitting there thinking in the back of my mind, he's, he's taking what all these other people are saying, what faith is, and they misuse this verse, and they talk about what this verse is, and it's that last part, the evidence of things not seen. And he says, if I believe that I have something, but I don't see that I have it, then that's faith. And I'm sitting there thinking, I think that's the exact opposite of what faith is. I yeah, I mean, you could, as Delilah said, you could believe you have a million dollars, but that doesn't mean you have a million dollars. And, you know, and it's one of those things, as I look back on the last few months that he was alive, you know, before cancer and all this other stuff took him, you know, he could sit at the table and smoke a cigarette and think that God was going to heal his body and that cigarette and the tar and the, the nicotine and all that stuff is going to have zero effect on his body. Well, it doesn't matter how hard you believe it or how strong you want to feel about that. It took him. Now, does that mean that he was weak in the faith or that he was missing something or that he had some sort of secret sin in his life that prevented God from healing him? No. Because that's not what God's doing today. The reason, and not to get off on why, why all that stuff, when Jesus Christ was healing people, it was because he was preparing them for the kingdom. He was preparing them for that tribulation period to go into that kingdom. And that's not what God's doing today. You know what? I want you to notice something real quick. First of all, Hebrews, the book of Hebrews. No one knows who the author is. The person, anyway a human author, we know that God wrote it. And that's the issue. That's the only thing that matters. The second thing is, is we should know, based on the title, who it's written to. Well, I do want to say one thing real quick. Um, that wasn't it. My, her cat meowed, but it's been a while since she's been on here. <clears throat> I do want to say one thing real quick. Um, 
I don't believe Paul wrote the book of Hebrews, and there's a whole bunch of reasons why. Um, you know, and then people people write up stories about this is why I don't believe Paul wrote Hebrews. He doesn't. He didn't. That's all you need to know. Let's move on. The big key here is who's it written to? Hebrews. I'm not a Hebrew. Delilah's not a Hebrew. The majority of the people that's watching this are not Hebrews. So then, he's not right. That book's not written to you. The second thing that I want you to notice in, in, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, notice, notice how does he start off oh, Hebrews 11, 1. He says, Now faith is. You know, we've often talked about this a lot of times. There's timing issues in the Bible. There's words that mean things. The words on the page mean things. When, when the writer of the book of Hebrews says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the, or the evidence of things not seen, there's a timing element involved. Well, when does that now take place? Well, if we know how to write the divide the Bible, we can apply that to it's going to be during the ages to come, that that now is going to be the issue. That relieves you from a whole set of theological issues and, and hoops you have to jump through because there's other things that's going on. And as you go down through there, and it's a, it's a wonderful read as you go down through there and see how people showed their faith. And we'll take a look at one of those here in a little bit. But notice it says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen a good report. Well, what's the it? Faith. By faith, the elders obtained a good report. Through faith, we understand that, God, that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. As we go down through there, we can, we can read these and, and it, you see where it says by faith and by faith and by faith and by faith and through faith and by faith and all that. As you go down through there, the issue really comes down in verse 3. Notice he says, through faith, we understand the worlds were framed by the word of God. The, world, the worlds were framed by the word of God. Were, were we present when God framed the worlds? The answer is no. How do we know that God framed the worlds? Well, we've got the book of Job. We've got the book of Genesis. We can go back and read and study how God framed the worlds with his word. The issue is God's word. Go with me to the book of Romans chapter 4. This is something that we went over probably three years ago maybe when we were going through the book of Romans or as we're continuing going through the book of Romans. <clears throat> One of these days we're going to be finished with Romans and everybody's going to be sad and they'll want to go through it again, which we will one day. Um, Romans chapter 4. If we go back to Romans chapter 4, I want you to notice we're going to start off in verse 1 and we'll skip down We'll skip down in the passage to get something and we're going to go back and, and, and take a look at some things. Notice in Romans chapter 4 verse 1. <clears throat> What shall we say then that Abraham our father as, as pertaining the, to the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham, what? Believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. What is the it in verse 3? Believing God. That's what faith is. Continue on. Now to him that worketh is a reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but what? Believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Drop down to verse 17. <clears throat> Notice. Romans chapter 4, verse 17. It says, as it is written, 
I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. I want you to think about something real quick. As a believer, you look at your life, and this is one of those things. <clears throat> I can't remember if I get to talk about this or not at the conference. I might have to sneak it in there, but I won't, I won't steal it from somebody else. But I don't want you to think about something real quick. <clears throat> I think I do get to talk about this. Your position, the position that you now have as a saint of the Most High God, you sat and you think about that. There's people... I don't know too many people that's watching that may be paying attention to NCAA basketball. Uh, there's a lady. She's no, 98, I think she is. She's 98 years old. Sister Jean. She's basically become the mascot for one of the Catholic schools that's in the tournament. And people are talking about how she has started making her bid for sainthood because They've got these miracle wins against these teams they shouldn't have won against. And so the idea in the Catholic Church is after you die, if there are at least, I think, what is it, three? I think it's three confirmed miracles that's performed by you posthumously, then that along with some other things, then you're granted sainthood. Well, luckily for you and I, we don't have to worry about that stuff because God's already declared us saints of the Most High God. In fact, Paul starts off in the book of Romans and he talks about to the saints that are at Rome. Then he goes over and he talks about the folks in Corinth and calls those folks saints. And if you want to look at a group of people who don't live up to the name of a saint, go read First and Second Corinthians. And so then when we look at this, when he goes over to Ephesians, he does the same thing and he does this over and over again. But I want you to think about this. <clears throat> God has already declared you and I righteous. Do we live like it? Do we act like it? Do we talk like it? No. God has already declared you and I as unblameable and unreprovable and unrebukable in his sight. Now, if you think and look at the life that we live, is there a point in our life that we could be rebuked? Is there a point in our life where we could be reproved? Is there a point in our life where someone could say, you're not living up to the standard as a Christian? The answer is yes. Thank God that God calleth those things which be not as though they were. God's already declared us that. In his mind, that's the way he looks at you and I. And what we do by faith is agree with what God says. That's the issue. Keep on going down through here. Verse 18. Notice, we're dealing with Abraham here. He believed God. Notice where he says in verse 17, who quickeneth the dead. That's going to be a key issue. Keep on reading verse 18. Who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was, notice, spoken, so shall thy seed be. What is it that Abraham is believing? He's believing what God has spoken to him. Verse 19. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. Notice, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. How is it that he was strong in faith? He believed the words that God spoke to him. Notice verse 21. And being fully persuaded that what he had promised. Now how did God promise something to Abraham? He spoke it to him. He was able also to perform. And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him. 
but for us also to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised for our justification. When we place our faith, when we, when we agree with what God's word says, that's faith. Paul, a little bit later on in the book of Romans, says, Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So then that might change your idea of what sin is. Is Sin really is, and you go back to Romans chapter 3, sin is just missing the mark. We've, we've all come short of the glory of God. Now, keep that in mind as you talk about glory and all the things that we've been talking about here. Remember when Moses said to God, show me your glory, and what did he do? He talked to him and showed him his mercy and his grace and his peace and his long-suffering and all that stuff. We all miss that. We miss that mark. But when we place our faith and we agree with what God says on, on the pages, it's that ascent of the mind to the truth, all it is is agreeing with the truth that God tells us. That's the main issue. Now, what does it mean when he, he, you know, back up in verse 17, he says, he believed even God who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. What does it mean that he knew that God who quickeneth the dead, go over to a Go back over to Hebrews chapter 11. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 11. And then let's go get Genesis chapter 17. <clears throat> so get Hebrews chapter 11 in one hand and Genesis chapter 17 in the other. You know, when we think about this, when Paul talks about fighting the good fight of faith, more often than not, we make it something that something that we have to attain to, something that we have to perform this step, this step, this step, this step, and once we've performed all these steps, then we can then we've then we've been able to do that. <clears throat> when it all really just comes down to trusting in what God's word says. That's the issue. Notice, notice in Genesis chapter 17. Go back to Genesis chapter 17, and we're going to go back over to um, Hebrews chapter 11. We'll get... We're going to take a look at something else on our way over there. But Genesis chapter 17, notice. And when Abram was 90 years old and nine... The Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. Now what is God doing to Abraham? He's talking to him. He's saying words to him. Notice. Walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be, called, shall be Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee. And I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me, notice, and thee and thy seed. So God's making a covenant between himself, Abraham, and Abraham's seed. Keep that in mind. Thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant. Now my question to you is, how long is everlasting? It lasts forever. It's in, it's in the Word. It's pretty self-explanatory. It's everlasting. It doesn't end. Notice, to be a God unto thee, unto Abraham. Now, how in the world can God be a God to Abraham 
if Abraham dies, and Abraham knows he's going to. Keep that in mind too as we, as we move forward as well. And to thy seed after thee. So God's going to be a God to Abraham and to his seed for in an everlasting covenant that he makes with them. One that lasts forever. Notice verse 8. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art, art, thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. He's saying, I'm going to be your God. I'm going to be your seed's God. I'm giving you an everlasting covenant. I'm giving you an everlasting possession of this land to you and your seed. Now go over real quick to Genesis chapter 22. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 22. And we've looked at this in other, other aspects before, but notice over in Genesis chapter 22, verse 1. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. Verse 2, And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. Notice, he woke up the next morning and was going to take his son up there. Why? Because God's word said, God told him, by word, take your son up here and I want you to offer him as a burnt offering. And Abraham does that by faith because he believed with what God's word said. He's agreeing with what God says. All right? And it's not just some blind faith that he's just going to follow God and his word and what he says, but there's a, there's a substance to it because the truth is the issue. All right? Keep on going. Uh, and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went in and went unto the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his, unto his young men, Abide here, or abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship. Notice what he says. And come unto you, or come again to you. What's he saying? Wait here, guys. I and the lad are going to go over here, and then we're coming back. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac, his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they were both of them together. Notice, Isaac also agreed. Notice, and you can see this, verse 7. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. And they came to the place which God had told, of him, told him of, and Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called upon unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do, the, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son. And he continues on down there. They find a ram that's in a thicket, and they, they take care of that. That's going to be the burnt offering, and then they go back down. Now I want you to, I want you to notice a couple of things here real quick. Abraham knows something based on what God told him in chapter 15. That what? There's going to be an everlasting covenant with him and his seed. Well, if God tells him you're going to have to go take this seed that I'm giving you and, and put him on the altar as a burnt offering, then there's something that Abraham knows. We're going to take a look at that. The next thing is, he tells the guys, I want you to stay here. I and the lad are going to go. We're going to come back. All right? Because he knows something. He knows that he and his seed are going to have this land for an everlasting possession which means they have to live forever. 
So why is it that he was so willing and able to take his son up there on that altar to tie him up and to bound him and get a knife and get ready to take care of and do what he needed to do? Well, here's how. He knew something. Go back, go over to Hebrews chapter 11. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 11. He was fully ready. He was fully ready to offer his son Isaac, his only son Isaac. And we, we've talked about that before. <clears throat> he, was, he was willing and able to offer up his son Isaac. He had him bound, had him on the wood, had the knife, had the fire in the other hand, getting ready to go. Why? Because he trusted, he agreed with what God said. The, the substance in which we believe is the issue. Can someone be faithful to a lie? You see that all over politics. You see that all over news, fake news if you want to call it that. People will believe whatever they want. And they they will agree with somebody on something. But the issue that we have is the authority and the veracity upon which or some other evidence that we have that we're placing our faith in a truth and the person that backs it up. Well, what Abraham was doing was placing his faith in the truth of God's word. And he knew God was able to perform something. And that's what we're going to see. Notice Hebrews chapter 11. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to start off in verse 17. There's something that Abraham knew from that covenant that allowed him to perform what he was going to perform. He was, as I said, he was ready to do that. He was ready to take the life of his only son. Here's why. Notice Hebrews 11 verse 17. By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac... And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. Notice. Of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Now, Abraham knew that in him and his seed, God is making an everlasting covenant. The only evidence that he had was God's word. The evidence that's the evidence that we have is his word. <clears throat> you know, when when you look at this, it's the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Can could Abraham see what was going to be the final thing with that covenant? Could Abraham see what was going to be that final layout of the land? Can you and I see what it's like to be unreprovable, unre unrebukable, and, un and no, there's not a way for us to be able to see that. The only way that we can see it is by faith, by taking God at his word, taking God at his word. Abraham knew that there was going to be an everlasting possession of the land. Abraham knew that there was going to be an everlasting covenant that God made with him and his seed. That means Abraham knew that he was going to be in that land. Abraham knew that he was going to be a part of that covenant. Not only that, but he knew that his seed would be too. He knew that his seed was going to be in that land. Who was his seed? Isaac. Now this is, this is very important because you notice... <clears throat> Verse 18, Hebrews 11, 18. Of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Now that right there is a quote from Genesis 21, 12. Which means what? We've got a record of something that God says to Abraham. He says to Abraham that in Isaac shall his seed be called. So then you go one chapter later and 
And God says, I want you to take your son Isaac, your only son Isaac, that seed that I promised you the line through, that seed that I promised would have would become many nations, and of that seed you're going to have this everlasting covenant, and of that seed you're going to have everlasting possession of a land. He says, what I want you to do with that, with that seed that I promised that to, I want you to take him up and, and present him on the altar as a burnt offering. And Abraham flat was ready to go. And had the angel of the Lord not showed up and that ram was caught in the thickets, he would have flat done it just as quick as you can think. Not because he was blinded by something, because he trusted God at his word. Notice, of whom it was said that in Isaac thy seed shall be called, notice, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. Why was it that Abraham was was able to take his son, his only son Isaac, and present him on an altar as a burnt offering and know that he says to the guys before, he says, stay here with the ass, the lad and I are going to go and we're going to come again unto you. Why was he able to say to those people, we're coming back? Did he know that God would supernaturally give him a ram in the thickets? No. Did he know that God would supernaturally present or an angel would come to him and say, don't do that? No. What he knew was God was able to bring him back to life. Why? Abraham knew something about everlasting life. Abraham knew about resurrection life. That was part of the promise that was given to him. Abraham knew that he was going to die. Abraham knew that he had resurrection powers, that God had resurrection powers, and that God was going to be able to resurrect his son even from the dead. Now you tell me, how did he know that? Because God said, there's an everlasting covenant that I'm making with you that lasts forever. Well, how can you have something that lasts forever if you die? That means you've got to be raised again. How is it that you can have everlasting possession of a land if you know you're going to die? Because God is able to raise him up from the dead. That's why it was possible. He knew something about resurrection life. And there's a lot of people today that don't understand resurrection life and it changes their perspective on things and that's why we have so many people who are exact opposite of Abraham who are weak in the faith. And they look at their circumstances rather than the word of God and say that God's doing stuff through this circumstance and that's not what God's doing. Abraham says, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead. He knew that if he took his son up, I mean, you think about this for a second. He knew that if he took his son up there on the altar and presented him to God as a burnt offering, do you know what was going to happen? God would raise him up and they'd go back down and they'd get those guys and they'd go back to camp. Go back to go back to Romans chapter 4. <clears throat> Let's, let's reread Romans chapter 4 with that thought process in mind. All right? What does it mean? Notice. Notice Romans chapter 4, verse 17. And this is, this is where it comes together because if you can put this together, then this will change. This, this could possibly change your life. Notice in Romans chapter 4, verse 17. <clears throat> Romans chapter 4, verse 17. As it is written, I've made thee a father of many nations before whom, or before him, whom he delivered, even God, who what? Quickeneth the dead. Do you know what that means? <laughs> he knows before you and I, before, before anybody else would have known, he knew that God was able to raise people from the dead, to make them alive again. Now, of course, now in the dispensation of the grace of God, that has something completely different. But do you know what he meant back then? There was a physical resurrection that they're looking forward to. Who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. Who against hope believed in hope 
that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was noticed, spoken, so shall thy seed be. The issue here is he's trusting God's word. He's trusting the words that God spoke to him. The complete opposite of what Adam and Eve did. Adam and Eve didn't trust God's word. The, the very first second that they, that they encountered the, the adversary, what do they do? Turn the, tuck their tail behind their, between their legs and, and they have no idea what they're doing. Why? They're opposite of what Abraham was. Notice in verse 19. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead, even he was about a hundred years old. Do you know what he was doing? He was looking at the circumstances and saying, that's not where my faith is. My faith is in the one who is able to resurrect the dead. My faith is in the one who can bring the dead back to life. Notice verse 20. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. Do you know what that promise is? That promise is everlasting life. How can you have an everlasting covenant and an everlasting possession of earth where Abraham's a part of it? He knew that the promise that God gave to them was everlasting life. Notice, <clears throat> he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. Do you know why he was strong in the faith and not weak in the faith? Is because he was placing his faith, he was believing, he was, he keeps on going, he's fully persuaded that what he had promised, what God had promised, he was able also to perform. He says, I know your word said, you spoke this to me. And I'm going to trust in that and that alone. And that's exactly what he did. He was fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. What time is it getting to be? 7.52. Man. We got a little bit farther than I thought it would. But, I mean, you think about that for a second. That's what faith is. Taking God at his word. Romans, Romans 10, 17. We all know it. We can quote it. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. The way that you have faith is when you hear God's word. Right? We know that, that God's word is spirit and it is life. And when you hear God's word, you hear, you have life from the word. I want to do one thing real quick. <clears throat> Go back to Deuteronomy chapter 32. Um, we won't get to it this week, so we'll continue on this next week uh, talking about faith. So I'll go ahead and tell you all, next week we're going to use a verse in Habakkuk, or Habakkuk, depends on how you want to pronounce it. Uh, we're going to take a look at a verse in, in Habakkuk. So then that gives you seven full days to find out. Find out where that is. All right. Yeah, to find the book of Habakkuk. I think that was it three chapters. There's three chapters, so it's kind of small anyway. So um, it's possible to flip through and miss it. So we'll get there. But tonight, Deuteronomy 32, and we'll finish off with this. Deuteronomy 32, and I want to spend a little bit more time on this next week as well. Deuteronomy 32. Much stuff I want to get in here. All right, Deuteronomy 32. Uh, let's start off in start off in verse 16. Read down through there. So Deuteronomy 32, verse 16. They provoked him to jealousy with strange gods, with abominations. Provoked they him to anger. So it's talking about the nation of Israel provoking God to jealousy and anger. All right, verse 17. They sacrificed unto devils, not to God, to gods whom they knew not to new gods that they newly came up with who your fathers feared not. Now, let's just 
I could spend a whole whole a whole night talking about new stuff. You know, what's the new thing? What's the latest thing? These are gods that they new gods that they newly came up, that they came newly up. They just created them in their mind, created new gods and said, Well, let's go worship this one. You know, Paul ran into that when he was in Ephesus. Well, I don't want to get off track. Keep on going. Verse 18. Of the rock that begat thee, thou art unmindful and hast forgotten God that formed thee. And when the Lord saw it, he abhorred them because of the provoking of his sons and of his daughters. And he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see that their end shall shall I will see what their end shall be, for they are a very froward generation. Now, what does it mean to be froward? To be perverse or fraudulent. Now, we can go, we can take a look. Paul talks about we're not, we're not as many who pervert the word of God. Well, how do you pervert the word of God? You add something to it. What were these people doing? They came up with new gods that they came newly up. They created new gods. They... They didn't worship God. They sacrificed unto devils. They sacrificed unto other gods. They created new gods, and they perverted it. But notice there, here what he says. For they are a froward generation, children in whom is no faith. The first time, and we, we've done this on, this on this whole series pretty much, the first time the word faith, the actual word faith shows up in the King James Bible is Deuteronomy 32, verse 20. And what is it? It's a group of people who have perverted, perverted the truth. They've added to it. They've changed it. They've created this fraudulent system. And God says that they're a fro they bury a very froward generation for they um, children in whom is no faith. Do you know what happens when you pervert the gospel? Do you know what happens when you pervert the word of God? There's no faith. Why? Because it's no longer God's word. Do you know why we care so much about the King James Bible and the fact that we have it preserved for us, that God's pervert, preserved it for us throughout time, is that we can have God's word because it's God's word that we place our faith in. And if it's not, and if it's perverted, then it's not God's word. And if you place your faith in something that's not God's word, then do you know what you are? You're a very froward generation. Right now in Christianity today, in the year 2018, they are a froward generation. Why? Because they've perverted the truth of the gospel and they perverted the truth and they perverted God's word. They're the antithesis of Abraham. They're just like unbelieving Israel. And then they wonder, well, what's happened to the church? Well, when you move away from the truth, don't be don't be soon shaken. Because you know that the fall is going to come after that. Alright, so we got through a third of page one. So based on that We'll have 33 parts of faith. No, we won't. We'll, we'll, we'll have to cut that. We might be two, maybe three. But <clears throat> the issue comes down to faith. Faith is something. Just taking God at his word. And do you know what the Spirit's going to do? He's going to help you do that. We're going to take a look at that. <clears throat> maybe not next time, but. We'll take a look at that, um, how that works in the life of the believer. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. I want to thank you all for joining us tonight. It's about 8 o'clock or maybe, yeah, it's right at 8 o'clock. Um, but I want to thank you all for joining us tonight. I, we appreciate it. If you all didn't show up, um, we'd still do it. But it makes it makes it a little bit better to be able to have conversations with folks before or after or during. I wish I could during, but uh, the way that's set up, if people have questions or comments, then you can post them on the.
Facebook page there for the video, and we, we can discuss things later. But uh, I want to thank you all for joining us tonight, and uh, we'll pick back up with faith next week, and uh, we'll end off with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to study your word. We're thankful for all the spiritual blessings in heavenly places, but we're more thankful for the fact that you've given us your word. Not just so that we know what we're supposed to do, but to know the things that you've done for us and to know that our faith in your truth is the issue. And that's all you're looking for today is people to place their faith in what your word says for salvation and for the coming to the knowledge of the truth, that we lay ourselves aside, our preconceived notions, our thoughts, our what we want it to be, and we just allow the words on the page to be the issue. And when we do, then we know that we're in your will. And we know that we can be fully persuaded that what you've said, you're also able to be able to perform it. We thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. And we thank you most of all for your son, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray.